Hi, and welcome to She's the Boss, the show that is all about female founders and women doing extraordinary things in business. And let me tell you, I cannot wait to introduce my guest today. Tracy Spicer is a global keynote speaker and MC. She's a broadcaster, the author of Good Girl Stripped Bear, a multi Walkley Award winning journalist, and of the national convener of Women in Media. And this is just some of the things she's done. So, welcome, Tracy. It's fantastic to have you on here. Thank you for that very kind introduction, <laughs> Jules. I love what you're doing. And that intro makes me sound very fancy, but truly, I'm very proudly a bogan from the outskirts of Brisbane. <laughs> That must be why we all love you so much. So let's start with what you're doing now. Uh, Do you want to tell everyone what you're doing now and why? Look, I'm doing a couple of things. From a very young age, I decided I wanted to have what's now called a portfolio career. And at the age of 53, I'm really happy to to say that it does work. You can do it. So I'm researching my second book after The Good Girl Strip there. I wrote my first draft chapter the other day. I'm doing keynote speaking and emceeing. And a lot of it globally now, one of the things that happened with the speaking market was we lost a lot of the face-to-face interviews interaction sadly with events and conferences but the flip side of that means that you're exposed to a more global audience through zoom or teams or whatever online video conferencing platform people are using i also still do a little bit of writing columns i do a lot of media and presentation training which i absolutely love and i've done that for about 25 years teaching other people the kind of stuff that i had to learn many years ago by making mistakes on the telly for decades (laughs) Well, if there's anything I can agree with, it's it's that it is a learning curve and a steep learning curve if you don't know anything about TV. So um, it's fantastic that you're teaching people. Look, it is. Everyone's expected to be a TV presenter, a lighting director and an audio expert (laughs) these days. So I can do a lot of my teaching via Zoom and it's even simple things like look at the lens to speak to your audience, which is not something that we're all born with that kind of knowledge. It's a skill that has to be learned. That's right. I remember telling people, you know, I mean, I'm looking into the camera now and you're down here. So it's quite a it's quite a weird skill to have to learn. But uh, it's it's wonderful to have you on here. Now, one of the things that I can see all the way, almost all the way through your career is your championing of women as well. So tell me a little bit about that, because obviously I've set up this show partly to put the spotlight on on a whole lot of amazing women, but also because I just feel like women particularly, and I'm 54, so a little bit older than you, um, of our age are almost invisible in the media. And I just want to change that and the fact that women in business don't really appear anywhere unless they've got some million, billion dollar um, sort of buyout or or investments. So um, can you tell me a little bit about why you have taken up the mantle for women in the media? We're really formed by how we're brought up with our families and the communities we live in. I strongly believe in that. And my sister and I were fortunate to have not only a very strong mother who said to us, you don't have to have kids, you can just have a career if you want, you know, take the road less travelled, the world is your right to grab every opportunity, just a wonderful, strong woman. But we also had a very sensitive father, which was unusual back in the day when there were really strongly reinforced gender stereotypes. So dad was a 50-50 parent. He did half the housework. They both worked shift work at different ends of the day. So we didn't grow up with this idea that men should be one way and women should be another way. That's why I've been always passionate about equal rights for everybody. And also growing up in a very working class area, you sort of see the, um, the structures in society that hold people back. Diversity Council Australia did some interesting research recently that said beyond a lot of things, class is what holds people back from getting ahead in their careers and moving ahead, you know, financially and in society and all of that. Which is really interesting, I think, because having grown up in England myself where class is so hard to to move between the classes, uh, I always sort of thought Australia was much more egalitarian, but you're right, there is still a class structure that makes it hard to get out of wherever you are and move into a different level. 
Yeah, I was speaking to someone the other day who grew up in a very wealthy household and she'd chosen to send her kids to a public school in Australia and all of her friends from the Sydney's eastern suburbs were saying to her, but if you don't have Cranbrook for your kids on their CVs, they're not going to get a job in banking or finance. (laughs) It was a real wake-up call for me coming from a working-class background. That had never occurred to me that people like that. that Or that the choices for wealthy people are banking and finance being the main ones. <laughs> That's what it was like, another world somewhere, yeah. even another planet. Right. So, um, okay, well, look, you alluded to the fact that you've grown up with these fabulous parents. Let's go back, if that's all right with you, to Tracy as a little girl. Um, what were you like at school? Did you enjoy school? And then I'm really interested to hear how you have managed to develop your career, which is an amazing career. Um, and I'm sure there would be girls watching who've been thinking about journalism and wondering how you can get on television and how you can have a career. So let's start with you as a little girl. Very annoying child, always <laughs> asking lots of questions. So my mum said from when I was a young age, she knew I'd either be a journalist or a lawyer because I last, I liked asking questions and I wouldn't stop until I got an answer. You know the old parenting thing of just because? Yes. Did not, did not work for me. <laughs> so when I went to school, I, you know, in high school, I saw Yana Vent on television for the first time and I thought I want to be her. Yeah. And I didn't only want to be a journalist or a news and current affairs host. I think deep down I wanted to be a slight dark-haired woman of Eastern European ancestry <laughs> because she seemed so much more sophisticated than being the bleached-haired bogan chick from Deadcliff <laughs> where I grew up. Oh, I think you're being a bit mean to yourself, but I get what you mean. And Yana was an incredible role model for a lot of women in those days or young yeah, girls. It's cliche now, but you can't be what you can't see. And no, I didn't see right. anyone like Yana in my circle. So that kind of role modelling on television was incredibly important. I was also the first person in my family to go to university. So I wanted to work very hard at school to be able to get in and do a university degree to become a journalist. Back in the day, it was more like you'd do a cadetship. But nowadays, if there's anyone watching who perhaps a young woman who aspires to be a journalist, it really is required that you do a university degree these days and it's incredibly difficult to get into. Right. But the keys are, you know, tenacity and persistence. When I graduated, I was unemployed for six months because I graduated at the time of the Black October stock market crash back in 1987. (laughs) So I just kept picking up the phone, you know, old school, there weren't emails, so sending letters, turning up on the doorstep of radio stations and newspapers and begging them for a job. Oh, my goodness, that is so tenacious of you. And I remember that time so well because that's when everyone went on and got two and then three degrees. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, there's going to be this whole generation of incredibly, you know, overqualified people because they couldn't get any work. So um, whose door did you knock on that they said yes? (laughs) A lovely radio station um, in Brisbane eventually gave me a job, uh, 4BH Bright and Beautiful Music it was called. Oh, great. there were some lovely fellas there because, you know, media back in those days was, of course, incredibly male-dominated. I was the only woman in the news room and they were lovely they treated me like their daughter and gave me some wonderful training and great opportunities actually and then I went and worked at 3AW in Melbourne and became a police reporter getting up at three o'clock in the morning and covering massacres and shootings how was that now how was that as a young woman seeing that kind of trauma um as part of your job I mean how did how did you cope that's very young to be dealing with those kind of um I guess, those kind of stories. Yeah, it's only now that we're talking about things like vicarious trauma for journalists as well as for people who work in the emergency services because back in the day it was never a consideration. You just drank a lot of alcohol to numb the pain. Numb the pain. That's right. Um, Engage in that black humour, that dark humour to almost laugh it off. But one thing that happened at that time was also very interesting around women's issues. I would pretty much go out, you know, every weekend to uh, a shooting or a hostage taking because I was the chief police reporter there at the age of 22, which is crazy thinking it about is it crazy, now. But- 
Great. But um, one of the hostage situations, I spoke to the police officer afterwards uh, and I was actually shot at in the middle of the road and a police officer had to jump on me. And I said afterwards, okay, what caused that? And he said, oh, it was just some guy taking his wife hostage. You know, he's been beating her up for oh, years. And I went back to the newsroom and I said, why don't we cover these stories? This kind of violence, if it happened on the street, on St Kilda Road, it would lead the bulletin in Melbourne, but yeah. because it happens behind closed doors, what it's like the tree that fell in the forest, nobody hears. So it's a real stain on society that we never questioned why we refused to cover these stories about domestic violence and kept this terrible plague on society hidden for decades and decades. And, and do you think that um, it's got worse now or do you think it's just being reported? Because thank goodness we are hearing about those stories just so that we can, I guess, try and do something about it because it is, just seems to be so prevalent and it's just so awful that you can't be safe in your own home. Do you think that it is getting worse? I mean, or, or do you feel that it's always been around and it's just being reported now? It's always been around and we talk about it now and it's reported. So it's seen to be a bigger issue in society now than it was in the past, but it's always been there. Yeah. And we are so fortunate to live at a time where not only is it being talked about, but if you look at, for example, the federal budget, there's more money towards services to support people. There's about more time, conversation I would have about to the say. <laughs> And about bloody time. Yeah, it is about time. Okay, so what does a 22-year-old who's been covering these, you know, full-on cases do next? Did you burn out of that job or did you just, I mean, or did it slide off your back to a certain extent? I was seduced by the bright lights of television. <laughs> I should probably say bizarre sights because my first television job was in Taralgon in Gippsland in regional wow. uh, Victoria as official cow, sheep, police, court and industrial reporter. <laughs> I can't even believe that they had a reporter that covered those particular topics. That's hilarious. Look, it is great. The young women I mentor, I say to them, go and work in the regions because you learn your craft from the ground up. You go to the courthouse every Monday and find a story there. You develop relationships with the farmers, with the union right. bosses, because that was a real industrial area, Taralgon, with the power stations and everything. Yeah. And you learn how to find a story without, I mean, these days a lot of people look on social media to find a story you actually go and talk to people on the ground really old school and and learn the tricks of the trade yeah and I mean it's a little bit like I think it sounds anyway like a little bit like running a small business in that you um, will have to do lots of jobs that you wouldn't do if you were in a really big business so you get to have a really good grounding as you say and um, and being in the regions presumably there aren't loads of people to go and load the cameras and do this and do that so you've got to do a lot of the jobs yourself and get to learn the you know from, from A to Z I know I worked in newspapers and it was local papers and we did the same thing I was writing I was writing restaurant reviews one minute and you know designing ads another minute but it was that whole kind of the idea of working across the whole all parts of the business and isn't it wonderful grounding? Yeah. That's a terrific analogy with business as well because the best business leaders we know are those ones who know everything that's happening on the factory floor, yeah. what job everyone does, how well they do it, how to actually do it themselves. That's yeah. absolutely key. So I loved working in the country, but it was also my first experience of overt sexism in the workplace. After working there for a right. year, I said to my boss, do you think I'll ever make it in the city like my hero yarn event <laughs> he said oh trace you're a good bird so i'll give it to you straight you'll never make it in the city i said why he said because you're blonde and people think blondes are stupid oh my god oh isn't that just that is such a fantastic reflection of the times that very you much love was. this jules i went out and bought a two dollar fifty tube of clairol and dyed my hair red oh my god that is hilarious that is so funny so then did you go and knock on some doors for tv in the city with your red hair I did with my newly minted red hair. I got a job at Channel 9 in Melbourne, the top rating newsroom in the country, Amazing. incredibly. And then I went on to work at Channel 10 in Melbourne as well, doing a combination of on the road reporting and news reading. Although my news anchoring career did not start well, I fainted not once but twice on television the first time I had the opportunity. Fainted? I've never fainted. heard that story. What happened? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll tell you the whole story, actually, Jules, and I'll walk back and show you exactly what happened. I promise this won't take long. <laughs> Go for it. Got up there and I started talking about the all-important weekend forecast and the squiggly lines on the screen when my heart started beating, my fingers started tingling, and I knew that I was going to faint. So <laughs> because I was presenting the weather and I was a hard news reporter, I was struck by imposter syndrome and I had a panic attack. Oh, so God. I thought, well, what can I do? I've got to get out of here, fight, flight or freeze, QF1, I'm out of here. So I looked straight down the barrel of the camera and I said, excuse me, I have to go now. Goodbye. Oh, how professional of you. So you managed to save the day and then fainted off screen. Totally fainted in the corner of the studio. The two presenters, David and Joe, were like clowns at the circus. They were like, do we give them out a mouth? This isn't in news reading for dummies. <laughs> And then what just a start. Like, an idiot, like an idiot, I went back the next night and did it all again. So my boss said, oh, it gets a bit hot in the studio with the, the lights. We'll put a fan on you like the Bee Gees. You'll be fine. <laughs> so I'm up there the next night talking about the all-important weekend forecast and the squiggly lines on the screen when I knew I was going to faint again. But at least I knew what to say this time. I looked straight down the barrel of the camera and I said, excuse me, I'm going to faint now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and so from that though I mean what's really interesting from that is they gave you another go they didn't say she's not going to be someone we're going to put in front of the screen so that's great mate it's actually a good story because three great things happen and this is something else I tell people who are starting out because when something like that happens you think it's the end of the world yes but three great things happened. First of all, I learned that I experienced panic and anxiety attacks uh, somewhat regularly. So I learned to breathe through them, and that's a gift for life. Right. The second great thing was I got an audition to read the full-time news in Brisbane because the boss said, well, after fainting on television, nothing's going to shock you anymore, and that's a great <laughs> gift for a newsreader. And also you can sit down. So that if you faint, you're not going to fall as far. Precisely. <laughs> you close in the earth. Centre of gravity is lower. I yeah. love it. <laughs> The third great thing that happened was a punk band started called the Fainting Weather Girls. Ah, and that's the coolest thing that's ever happened in my life. <laughs> did they did they name check you in the in the song? <laughs> Do you know what they didn't? And I wish I could find a copy of Me Fainting and also the Fainting Weather Girls song, but it was back in the day, you know, prior to YouTube or digital copies of anything. It's all lost in history, which in oh. some ways is a good thing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think having a song named after you is pretty cool or a song even created because of what you've done. Okay, so you then started reading the news. And, I mean, I think you're such a familiar face to anyone, certainly of my age, uh, for years and years and years being on television. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you build a career in, in TV news and on television as a woman, particularly, I guess, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago? There's a lot of similarities between newsrooms and corporate environments. Right. Uh, both are very hierarchical. Mm -hmm. They're very male-dominated. And you have to learn office politics. I was never any good at office politics. Right. I am never good at seeing the play. I'm just one of those good girls who gets there, does the job and goes home. Right. So one thing I've learned over the past 20 years is Certainly, objectively, I did well in this career through bloody hard work and tenacity. Yeah. But if I had my time again, I would have learned office politics a little bit better because I just expected that by turning up and doing a good job, the opportunities would come rather than actually putting oneself forward for opportunities and even things like asking for pay rises. Because uh, right. after that time of fainting on television, I worked at Channel 10 in Brisbane for two years as a full-time newsreader and then... Uh, 14 years at Channel 10 in Sydney, news reading and doing the great joy of my career, documentaries in developing countries on women and girls. Oh. But during that entire time, uh, not only did I never ask for a pay rise, when the boss actually came up to me once and said, it's time for contract negotiation, you probably should ask for something, I said to him and Jules, you're going to hate this. 
this. I said, please don't give me a pay rise. I feel privileged just to work here. Oh, that's, you know, that sounds like something that would come out of my mouth as well oh, at, really? that, at that age because, I don't know, you, you, you do feel thrilled and there's a whole lot of, I don't know. I mean, look, I haven't worked in corporate, so I haven't had to ask for pay rises pretty much my whole career, but I, I can imagine how terrifying it is. So I get it that you would deflect it, but... Um, what actually, so what did you do? I mean, presumably somebody negotiated for you, but when you say you wish you'd learned office politics, how do you think that held you back just in terms of jobs or were there people undermining you? Both. Right. Um, the, oh, I have to be very careful about how I say this because I firmly believe that there is such power in the sisterhood, in women joining Absolutely. together and forging forward. And I was always, always more than happy to mentor younger women, to speak out on their behalf and all of that kind of stuff. And Good I think you. that's something that everyone should do. Yes, so do I. But friends of mine in the women's sector have given me some language around this that really helps. They say, in workplaces like this, there's a scarcity mentality. When there are very few women, yep. a handful of women, but uh, some of them see that the other women are their competition, that there's only a few roles and a few opportunities at the very upper echelon and they have to tear the other women down to get there. Exactly. And I think that scarcity mentality is a terrible shame because it holds all women back. Having said that, the men were just as competitive. When yeah. you're working in an environment like the media or corporates, it's a really competitive space. So I don't want to be too gender specific on no, this. No, I, I feel that in those environments, the powers that be up at the top think that by people competing for the jobs that they get better and better and better rather than completely undermining any kind of bonding or team teamwork. They don't care about the team so much as getting everybody to do their best and they believe that the best way to do that is to get people competing against each other. I really feel like that's a um, something that has gone, you know, it's it's part of patriarchy. It, it is men are very competitive anyway and therefore as a woman to be in that environment, you need to act like a man really if you're going to get ahead, especially in the olden days. You've hit the nail on the head, Jules, and here's an anecdote that exemplifies that. Yep. Channel 9 had a deliberate policy and strategy for many decades of and this, uh, I saw this happen at Channel 9 in Melbourne uh, 28 years ago. They would hire one woman and then they'd hire a woman who looks really similar to that woman and then play those two women off against each other. Really? And they'd sit you down in the office and say, oh, yeah, it was great that you got that story, but, gee, Lisa, she had a better story yesterday. So they would pit you against each other in that active patriarchal kind of way it's really shocking isn't it that 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 that, was, that that has been and is still in some organizations seen as the best way to get the best out of people it's just so yeah. counterintuitive really in terms of how we now know particularly for women that encouragement and praise are the ways to get the best out of people not getting them fighting against each other that's right. Look, things have changed dramatically yeah. and I'm naturally a glass half full kind of person. Those toxic workplaces, they don't work for the bottom line and people have realised that as well as the fact that they absolutely crush people. So yeah. it is wonderful to live at a time in history where workplaces are more, have a more flat structure generally, they're less hierarchical and that we're talking about these issues. I was going to say, at least they're aware now. I feel like there wasn't the awareness before. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's been solved, but I definitely you're hearing about diversity, you're hearing about gender equality now, and that wasn't something that anyone was even talking about even 10 years ago, I would say. It's exactly right. I mean, even at that time when I finished up at Network 10, I'd still only in all of those years had one female boss in, I guess, almost two decades. Isn't that extraordinary? Radio. Yeah. But, you know, but it was, I mean, because I want to start this TV network, I've been kind of out there and doing research and then it was like a gift from the gods really in terms of what I'm trying to do. That research came out last, late last year. You probably saw it about um, who is making the decisions in terms of what we watch on television. It was about program directors and it was saying that over a three-year period, um, they interviewed all these people and 100% of the decision makers are white Anglo-Saxon men over 50. And it was like, well, that complete kind of explains everything, doesn't it? Why we're so invisible, why we don't have a voice, why women in business aren't 
relate uh, aren't seen on television because those decisions are being made by people that have no no understanding of what's kind of going on out there in, in, in the real world, I think. It's exactly right. I did some research on that for my book, shameless plug there, uh, the good right. there about how there's this, I think I call them the Great White Brotherhood, the scrolls of the Great yeah. White Brotherhood, about what would work on television. And it's all to do with their own gut feeling and unconscious bias. Yeah. So what people are seeking, television viewers, is more diversity. People want to see people who look like them. Yep. You know, the broad cultural diversity, age diversity, ability diversity, sexuality, everything. And because they're not seeing themselves reflected back to them enough on mainstream television, that's what really precipitated the fragmentation of the mass media alongside the rise of technology and social media. So, you know, it's something they should have realised a long time ago. Well, yes. I mean, I, I even look now at newspapers and magazines and mainstream television and go, where's the innovation? Like, come on, guys, this has been coming for a long time. and But, I mean, you know, the flip side of it is fantastic. It's giving all of us an opportunity to go out and create the content that we'd like to be able to see on television ourselves and put it through channels like YouTube and, and, um, and other streaming channels and streaming networks. So, Tracy, I want to hear more about the end why you decided to get out of television and and for and then you've got to tell me more about the book as well and the new book that you're writing so let's start with ending your career in television why did you decide to do that the decision in a way was made for me when I um, was asked weeks after returning from maternity leave with my <laughs> second child at channel 10 and I decided to take that to the federal court and start a national conversation in the media about yes, pregnancy discrimination. Oh God, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it was one Gotta of those opportunities, you know, privileged white woman working in the media with a platform. I thought I can either sign the press release saying I'd chosen to leave for family reasons, which was a lie, yeah. or I could finally start an important conversation that needed to be had when one in two women were experiencing what I was experiencing. Yeah. And I'm really delighted, you know, in in retrospect that I did that, although it was hard at the time. Very brave of you, I have to say, very brave, because it is scary going out on a limb and when you've got profile as well, so you know the media are going to jump on it and the media that know you are going to jump on it. it it's extremely brave of you to do that. Oh, look, it's kind of you to say, I don't know whether it was brave. I just felt like I had no other choice, that right. I had to. You know, you have those moments in your career, those light bulb moments where yep. you have all of these experiences of discrimination, sexism, bullying, and it's like the death of by a thousand cuts. You get to the point where you either leave the industry because you can't take any more or you say, right, I'm going to try to change things from within by standing up and articulating what everyone knows is the case. Yeah. So I did that. I settled out of court because I had mastitis five times, terrible postnatal oh, depression. It was mastitis five times. Times. Yeah, it was really it was really tough. But well, the, the PND, I wonder whether that was exacerbated by what was going on at work. I'd say so because we had two kids very close together. So having a baby and a toddler and taking that court action, even though my husband is one of those fantastic 50-50 parents, very supportive, it was an incredibly difficult time. Very stressful. And I thought it was the end of my career, but remarkably it wasn't because it happened at that time when these conversations were starting to be had yeah. in this wave of feminism globally. And because of the fragmentation of the mass media, there were grassroots groups collecting on social media and talking about these issues around the world, which is fabulous. So I actually got... A really terrific job at Sky News, actually, which gave me a new skill, being able to do that 24-hour rolling news where you've got to ad lib, as well as really just reading at auto cue, gave right. me the opportunity to write columns about social justice and women's issues, and then to do some talkback radio broadcasting about these kind of topics that so, I was passionate about. So, so in retrospect, it actually opened up a whole new uh, branch of my career. And was it intentional? Did you go? Did you leave saying that's it? I'm going to start championing women because your book very much caused a stir around that as well. Or did it just kind of inadvertently happen organically to you that this was what was important to you and you were talking about it? And so, or did you kind of leave going, that's it? Now I want to start making some change in that space. 
Initially, when I left, I mainly just wanted to heal myself, actually, yeah. and spend time with the kids. So, first of all, I took very few shifts at Sky, and I started working for a little family travel magazine two days a week, building nice. up my writing skills, because what... I knew that I wanted to write and broadcast about women's issues, but I'd done my career backwards. I did the university degree and went straight into broadcast, so I didn't learn those robust writing skills that newspaper right. journalists learn. So that's why I wanted to do a little bit of magazine work, which was an easy way into writing. It was something I could do from home with the kids. And then I built up the confidence to be able to pitch to newspapers and, again, that tenacity thing. I felt like I was starting from the ground up. And okay, I just have to, a little light aside. Did you choose a travel mag because of the travel? <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> I was just going to go, you've got two young kids and there are bound to be family holidays to be reviewed. What a great idea. I know when I worked in, um, I worked for a company called Peter Isaacson Publications for many years and I used to be so jealous of the food and wine reviewers and the travel reviewers because they just got such great perks with the job. Oh, look, you're absolutely right. It was, uh, I went in there to learn more about writing, but then all of a sudden I'm in Morocco with a toddler <laughs> and a baby and my son is kissing a monkey on the lips and I'm like, well, I did not expect my life to go this way, but this is awesome. Yeah, how fabulous. Okay, so, so then let's get to the book. So when did you decide to write the book and wh why did you come up with that topic? <sighs> Uh, I wanted to talk about all different aspects of women's issues that I'd experienced in the workplace. And I also wanted to write about, you know, some of these women and girls that I've met in developing countries when I did some documentaries for World Vision and Action Aid, because the Australian media is generally quite white bread, unless you watch SBS. You yeah. know, you don't get a lot of world news. So you actually, I always say you wouldn't even know that there's a whole lot of countries outside of Australia in our news a lot of the time. Oh, precisely. We're very, you know, there's a, if it's Sydney, there's a crash on the M2, you know, and that leads the board. That's and right. Forget the fact like that there's that. a war somewhere else or, you know, a landslide in some European country, yeah. It's exactly right. So I wanted to incorporate all of these angles into a memoir, but kind of call it a femoir, a feminist <laughs> memoir. And to be honest with you, Jules, the other reason I wanted to write it is because a lot of my colleagues, you know, lovely, lovely blokes in their 50s and 60s who I've known for years and years and years. Yeah. They have no hesitation about writing their memoir, writing their life story about yep. all the stories they've covered. But there are very few of my female journalist colleagues who have written a memoir up until recent years. And I thought, gee, there's another disparity because yep. these kind of things are historical. People are going to look back on that time and think, oh, there were only men in the media at that time. Well, no, there were women doing things too. Yeah, having having to navigate that very male environment. Hmm. So so you decided you'd write a book. How did you go about doing that? <laughs> well, <laughs> someone, someone who's a 24-hour news journal who just bashes out a 600-word piece in an hour straight from the heart without thinking too much about it. <laughs> I'd never written 90,000 words before, so I was freaking out. I'm a short-form journalist. I, right. I don't have the patience for long form, to be honest. Up until you know, well, you getting older, you get more patience and stuff. So I, I had to mark it out mathematically. Right. I would write three days a week, one thousand words each day, and I'd okay. write that between ten and three o'clock, and then I'd go and pick up the kids from school, and hubby would drop them to school in the morning. And before I wrote, I'd go for a walk. You know that Mark Twain thing: go for a walk in a forest to get your juices flowing before you right. write. You know, I was reading about what other, what actual real writers do before I put pen to paper in the old vernacular because I had no idea how I'd write that but it's just like the eat an elephant thing it's one spoonful at a time. So as you were writing it and talking about feminist issues did you start to get really involved in 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 the book and so you know it became a joy to write or was it a bit of a slog all the way through? Oh, no, it was an absolute joy. I loved locking myself away and just going on the journey. And because I wrote it as a humorous book, because I thought dealing with serious issues, the best way to get the communication across is through Make humor, smile. you yep. know, the whole psychology of communication stuff. It was an absolute joy. Like I'd write a really outrageous comedy line and then I'd think, oh, my God, can I go that far? You know, it was really And then you think fun. it's my and book. Of course I can. <laughs> That's right. It was really ripping fun as a creative exercise. I loved it. 
Right. And so um, what what did you do after the book came out? So I, I know that it got a lot of media in Australia. Did you do a whole lot of tours? Did it open up new opportunities for you? I feel sorry for authors these days not being able to do the festivals and the launches because that's where you sell books. That's right. where you find your target market. It's um, very labour-intensive actually selling a book because you've really got to go out and find the readers and give them a reason to buy your book. Right. And so I certainly did a lot of travelling at the time and one, what happened four months after it came out was the hashtag Me Too movement. Oh, started. my God, it was that course, close. I didn't yeah, realise. Yeah, the, right. the Me Too movement was started Perfect by Joanna timing. Burke 15 years earlier, but the Hollywood story started to break. Yeah. And so this whole conversation, I mean, in my book I wrote about every instance of sexual harassment and indecent assault in my life. And my right. husband said, why are you writing about these personal things? I said, because if we don't start talking about it and That's sharing right. our stories, nothing will change. So the zeitgeist kind of took over globally in society and I sent out a that tweet. wave. That wave, yeah. And that's when I started receiving people's stories about abuse and harassment and oh. misconduct. And, you know, it's kind of, it's incredible to look back on, well, that was 2017, I guess, four years ago, how much the world has changed since then, how much the conversation has changed. And it really has been an incredible wave to live through that we are talking about these things that, you know, I've got a 14-year-old daughter. She's so feisty. She's <laughs> like, you know, if someone yelled out to her in the street, I'm sure she'd absolutely... Turn around and bop them on the nose maybe. That's exactly right. You've got really well, Jules. Whereas I just want to go on, oh, scared. So yeah, things will change away. hugely. No, that's, a, that's absolutely fantastic. And so uh, once you've written a book like this, which is just so amazing, um, what, what is your next book about? You said you've just started writing it. What's it going to be about? Get ready for your eyes to glaze over. I've still got to get. A, I've still got to work out a good elevator pitch for this one. But I'm fascinated by the intersection between artificial intelligence and machine learning and race and gender. Oh. It's what's known on social media as AI bias. Right. So it's things like eighty percent of people keep the voice of Siri or Alexa on female, yeah. and then they order the female robot around with no politeness. People like. Oh, abuse oh my goodness! Right. Their home devices, they throw them against the wall and say, "Shut up, bitch." So this whole domestic violence, sexual assault, I sexual abuse, never and harassment, yeah, is being embedded into the robots that are going to be running our lives in the next fifty years. Amazing. And, you know, I've interviewed the woman who is the voice of Siri in Australia. Her, oh name, her name is Karen Jacobson, and she had no idea. Uh, what they did was they she lived in New York. They wanted an Australian who lived in New York in a certain part. Like she was, it, they were so specific, and she ticked all the boxes. And they took her away for, for I think she said it was five days, 50 hours, maybe it was two weeks. And she literally recorded every phonetic word or sound that you can make and then they stitch it together and the first time she knew that she had her voice had been used was in a gps when someone rang her and said uh, we're listening to our gps and i think it's your voice karen and now she said she gets into lifts and there's siri and there's all the rest of it and she's in a billion people's homes but no idea at the time how it was going to be used that's a great story. You know, I want to interview her for the book because there's been a lot of controversy in the last couple of years about Siri being programmed. If someone brings up, what do you think about feminism, Siri? What do you think about racism? Siri's programmed to be to neutral on racism. I mean, how can you be God. neutral on racism? Surely all racism is bad. Yeah, absolutely. Of course it is. That's shocking. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't use Siri, so I haven't asked those questions, but I've got three young boys and they do like to ask silly questions of Siri and wait to see what the answer is. So, um, yeah, things need to be changed. And I would obviously, I'll introduce you to Karen Jacobson. She's an amazing woman. So, that would be um, fantastic. I'd love to hear what your boys say about Siri and Alexa because the first line in my book is going to be the story about my son turning around when he was 11 and saying, Mama, I want a robot slave. Oh, my God, did he? Oh, no, I haven't had any comments like that, but I guess they kind of have a robot slave because they're using 
the Google, you know, those little doodads that they have. I don't know. They've got them in their room and they go, turn the lights off, turn the lights on, you know, turn on my laptop, play this game. And, uh, and, and it's controlling everything. But I don't think it's got a voice that speaks back to them. Ah, um, very good. But do you know what? By uh, and again, I could I, I could talk the leg off a chair about this, and I promise this will be the last thing I say. But <laughs> right. By twenty twenty five, we are going to be talking to our voice activated assistants more than we talk to our partners or our children. See, it's funny that sounds so shocking, and yet if you told me ten years ago that we would it be 10 years ago? No, probably 15 years ago, that we would have little phones and that we would be staring at them the whole time, all day and all night, really. Uh, and I mean, I love my phone. So it's not, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying you never would have thought that people wouldn't be reading newspapers and watching television in preference to looking at their phone. Absolutely. Uh, the pace of change is exponential. Is, and absolutely. while I've been passionate about women's issues and social justice my whole life, I'm now concerned that bias is being embedded into the next generation and we're not even addressing it now. Well, look, so many people aren't aware of it. And I think the best example that I heard about unconscious bias, um, and, and I really kind of, I don't think I understood it till that moment, was a woman that on LinkedIn, in was talking about the reading list for people doing MBAs and she showed this list and every single author of an MBA book was a male Anglo a white Anglo-Saxon male and I, I thought wow and she was saying and here's the alternative list you know with a whole lot of women in there as well and I thought if men and women are doing MBAs which are sort of you know the top of the tree in terms of business and they are always reading from authority figures that are white Anglo-Saxon men then of course you come out of it not thinking consciously, you know, men are smarter than me, but obviously it's got to have an effect on you. And that was the best example that I ever got that I went, I get it now. Like there's a whole lot of stuff we don't even think about. And like you say, that Siri is a female voice and everyone goes, oh, it's nice and calming. Forget about the fact that people can then, you know, push them around and speak to them like a slave. You're exactly That's right. Me. It's amazing. And it reinforces those gender stereotypes yeah. that women are servile. There's another good example about unconscious bias of a group of white tech guys who created this wonderful automatic soap dispenser. Right. But it only worked if white hands were put under it. It didn't oh. work if black hands were put under it. Oh, my God. Now, extrapolate that to medical technology. Yes. Where there's going to be a lot more artificial intelligence and machine learning that learns those biases and people could be losing their lives if they're not a white person who fits the stereotype of the person who created it. Yeah. And I mean, look right down to uh, the other thing that I heard, which I'd never thought of. And I was talking with Sam White, who runs Stella Car Insurance for Women. And she said, seatbelts have been designed for men. And I was like, don't be silly. And then I thought, yes, they have, because they never fit on a woman's boobs. If you've got boobs, you can't wear seatbelts comfortably ever. It's exactly right. And then even further, crash test dummies for many years prior to the last couple of years were always well, we're... a male body size and shape. And so nobody knew how a crash impact would affect a woman's body. And just It's just those tiny little things that you don't even think about. Well, listen, Tracy, you are absolutely amazing. I have loved this. I could keep talking to you for about another three hours, but we're pretty much at the end. If anybody wants to be trained by you or to contact you, what's the best way to get hold of you? Uh, they can hop onto my website, which I am currently revamping, actually, tracyspicer.com.au. It's been a delight to talk to you, Jules. I love what you're doing. Congratulations, and thanks for being a trailblazer. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for telling us your story. My pleasure.